Welcome to Darien Library. My name is Erin Shea. I'm the head of adult programming here, and I'm very pleased to welcome you on this warm summer evening. I would just like to mention that programs at the library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much for your continued support to make programs like these available to the community. Tonight we have a very special program planned for you. Uh, lots of times we'll hear an author speak just here at the podium, but every once in a while we love, love to have someone come in and interview the author. I think it, mixing up the format makes it really interesting and exciting. And so what I'm going to do is introduce our interviewer, and then he's going to introduce our guest of honor. So please join me in welcoming John Valeri of the Hartford Books Examiner here to interview our author this evening. Gosh. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming out. I see some faces I know, which is nice. And I see some faces that I don't know, which is equally nice. Um, I am very much honored to be here tonight. There's not even a screening process. I don't know if they'll let me back. But. So anyway, um, again, thank you very much for coming out tonight. This is a great honor for me, I will tell you. I don't know if you'll believe this or not, but I have been a fan of Marsha's for 20 years. Since I was 12 years old, don't do the math, it'll be as painful for you as it is for me. Um, so this is, you know, a really fine honor for me. Uh, and when I was invited, of course, I jumped at the opportunity. And then I was told that it would be Oprah style. And I said, Oprah style, what, what is Oprah style? And apparently Oprah style is two nice comfy chairs and some microphones and a table and water, and apparently wine. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't want to disappoint anybody, so I figured I would let you know right off the bat that as far as I know, we're not giving away any cars tonight. <laughs> but you have Marsha. Um, there's nothing under your chairs but your belongings and possibly gum. <laughs> and Gail King is nowhere to be found. <laughs> Though we do love Gail King. Um, I had a joke. Can't remember my joke. <laughs> this joke I might regret. But I was going to say, you know, this is Darianne, so I, I dressed up a little bit. There was the debate of, you know, <laughs> pants or jeans or... And there's this, this shirt that I debated wearing, but, you know, I was going to try it on. I wasn't sure if it would fit. <laughs> <You know. laughs> But I'm not going to wear it. And also, I have to tell you, Marcia, I got a haircut in preparation for this, and that's all people have wanted to talk about. My hair. I don't know what that's Or lack thereof. I was at the barber, and the woman looked at the top of my head, and she said, oh, I see you've been out in the sun. <laughs> that is my life. But anyway, I think that you all, you know, know Marcia. But I thought that I would talk to you a little bit about her before we have a conversation. And I'm going to start, of course, with Marsha the lawyer. You might remember she tried a little case way back when. Um, but her career, and I think some of you might find this interesting, she began her career as a criminal defense attorney. Surprise, right? And joined the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office in 1981. She was there for 14 years. Ten of those years she spent in the Special Trials Unit, which is the unit that deals with the most complex, high-profile cases. And Marsha, if I'm correct, you were the first woman member when it was a very, very small unit. Ten people, something Five. like that. Five. So that tells you something about her intellect, right? Uh, so in addition to the case that everybody knows, and actually, I figured I would throw out a literary reference really quickly about that case now that I've made my joke. I'm thinking a literary reference, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit Harry Potter to you guys. And I was thinking Voldemort, right? So that case, for the purposes of this evening, is sort of going to be that which shall not be mentioned, if you're agreeable to go along with that. Um, but Marsha is a prosecutor, won 19 of 20 homicide cases prior to Simpson, and that included the prosecution of Robert Bardo for the stalking and murder of actress Rebecca Schaefer. And that was actually a case that resulted in legislation that offered victims better protection from stalkers and increased punishment for the offenders. 
Um, Post Simpson, Marsha has been very busy. In 1997, she published a memoir, Without a Doubt. I can tell you I am notoriously indecisive as a person and as a reader, but that is probably one of my favorite books of all time, a credit to you. And that book reached number one on the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, LA Times, and also the Publishers Weekly's bestseller list. Uh, Marsha has also traveled the country for speaking engagements regarding women's issues such as domestic violence, high profile cases, and public service careers. She was under contract as a legal analyst for NBC, CNBC, and MSNBC, and continues to provide legal and expert commentary for television and radio. She has sold hour-long pilots to the FX network, Lifetime, and VH1, and developed a half-hour comedy for NBC. She has also developed reality projects for CBS and was an executive producer of a one-hour reality pilot for CBS. And topping all that, of course, last year, Marsha had a cameo on Pretty Little Liars. In case you missed it. <laughs> and something that you might not know, because there seems to be this perception that you no longer are in the legal field, but you are because Marsha continues to practice appellate law. So that's Marsha the person, Marsha the transition, but now we are going to talk about Marsha the crime fiction writer. Uh, as you may know, she published her first crime thriller in 2011. That was Guilt by Association. And I will tell you, that was one of those books that I had this you know, great anticipation for and also a little bit of trepidation because you've been talking about wanting to write that book for years and years and years. And a lot of times, you know, lawyers who don't practice in the courtroom anymore, a lot of times they write books. And a lot of times they're not very good. And also I'd had, what, 16 years waiting for that book. <laughs> and it arrived. And I will tell you, writing for the Hartford Books Examiner, I earned partial pennies. I didn't even know that that was something that existed until I started writing for the Hartford Books Examiners, but literally I get paid in partial pennies depending on you know, who reads my thing. It pays for itself in other ways. For instance, I am here tonight with Marsha Clark. Um, but also I was able to read her book about five months before it was published. And the greatest relief was to find how absolutely amazing it was. And I thought, OK, maybe it's me. I might be a little biased. I'm probably still a little biased. But that book went on to become a national bestseller. It was nominated for a Nero Wolf Award. It received star reviews from Publishers Weekly, Booklist, and Kirkus. And if you can get Kirkus to say nice things about you, that's you know pretty amazing. And also, that was the book that introduced Rachel Knight, who very much like Marsha Clark was a she's a prosecutor in the Special Trials Unit at the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office. Also, she has two best gal pals. LAPD Detective Bailey Keller, and also a fellow Deputy District Attorney, Tony LaCallier. Did I say that correctly? OK, just check. Right? And so I thought quickly, since we're talking tonight about Marsha and her fiction writing, that I would share some of the words that others have had to say about her work. Uh, so David Baldacci, on her debut, said, Marsha Clark's debut novel showcases her experience and knowledge of the legal system, the pace, plot and dialogue are as sharp as they come in the genre. Her character of Rachel Knight bleeds real blood, sweat and tears on the page. Guilt is a four-bagger for Clark and her new fans who will eagerly await her next step up to the plate. <coughs> James Elroy said, you must read this book. It is wildly and complexly plotted, ebulliently witty and filled with riotous humor. It details the inner workings of the LA legal system with unprecedented accuracy and verve. And to top it off, it's a damn, damn good thriller. And finally, we have James Patterson, who said it's no big surprise that Marsha Clark knows her way around a courtroom in a murder mystery, but she's also a terrific writer and storyteller. Almost. Um, tonight, we are here to celebrate Marsha's new book, The Competition. It's the fourth book in the Rachel Knight series, just came out today. Um, I have to tell you, I stopped by my local Barnes & Noble earlier today. Not that I wasn't going to buy a book here, because I was, and we did. Um, but I've been talking the book up and talking the book up, and I went, and my friend Chris went to the Barnes & Noble and couldn't find the book anywhere, so I asked, where's the book? And they said that the word of mouth has been so positive that their entire stock was put on reserve. So they couldn't even put it out on the shelves because that many people had called in advance and wanted copies. So that's pretty incredible. 
Um, and this book has also earned a starred review from Booklist, who said Clark handles sometimes painfully raw scenes with great sensitivity and skillfully works in material about what makes a mass murderer as she ratchets up suspense to a deadly conclusion. Conclusion, sorry. Her fourth legal thriller featuring Knight is another tour de force. Further, Publishers Weekly said the twisty plot and dynamic duo make for a suspenseful, if sobering, page turner. Um, and a couple of months ago, to sort of return to that Oprah motif, Marsha appeared on the OWN Network show Where Are They Now? And one of the things that she had mentioned is that I hope that there will be a time that people say, oh yeah, Marsha Clark, the author of the Rachel Knight Mystery Series. Well, tonight is that night. I am truly honored and privileged to introduce to you Marsha Clark, the author of the Rachel Knight Mystery Series. to share with you the experience of being a prosecutor, the real job, the real 
real life, the mission that it is. It's not just a job, it's a mission. And, and you stand up for the victims and you do justice and it's all about that. And that's what you do every day. You don't have cameras and, you know, and, and commentators and all that craziness. Um, and that's what I wanted to do in the Rachel Mike series, is bring to you and share with you that world. I, you, know, you know, I had mentioned I had a joke and I forgot it. It came back to me. I'm a little off topic, but my family's, some of them are right here in the first row. And that kind of reminded me. I was telling you that I've been a fan of Marsha's for many years throughout all the iterations. And it's great that you fell into books, because that's my other great love. Um, but I always felt, you know, way back in the day, 1994, 1995, that we would end up, you know, somehow in a public forum together. And my family, I think, would have agreed with that, except they probably would have expected it to be a courtroom. <laughs> So I think we're all relatively pleased by this turn of events. Anyway, back to the subject at hand. You'll have to forgive me. I go off topic sometimes, but hey, that's what makes it interesting. It was the wine. You are a cheap date. Yes, I am. Happy hour is my favorite hour. The happiest of hours. Yes. Okay, now my next question you, you sort of addressed because you talked about some of the similarities that you have with Rachel, though, you know, you say she's smarter and she's younger and she's this and this. I think you sell yourself short. But since you told us about the similarities, if you, if you had to pick what the greatest difference between you and Rachel and I is, what would you say? See, this is what she meant when she said sometimes uh, I have to talk. She does, she, you know, uh, I know, and, and I'm not, and I'm, I'm, she might have, she might be actually more, um, mm -hmm. how do I put this? When I was in the DA's office, I mean, every office has politics, right? You always have to, you know, in some respect, make nice to people. Only I thought I didn't have to. I thought I could just work really hard and be good and, you know, be the rebel without a clue. And I, I was, and so it came time for promotions, and uh, I did not have an angel, you know, in management because I had been busy not kissing any ass, and um, and I came up short and realized, hey, you can't live like that, you can't be like that. People will not just promote you because you're working really hard. You actually have to be nice to someone. <laughs> I was mean. I just, you know what I mean. I just never did anything social at all. Um, or anything. So um, I learned my lesson, and then I got you know more social and more you know graceful about being um, saying hello <laughs> or good morning, which I, before I apparently didn't think was you know necessary. So Rachel, on the other hand, still doesn't, and she butts heads. And I did. I mean, I still butted heads with her, but she does more so. <laughs> She's more impulsive. She's more headstrong. She gets into it with the DA and mixes it up a little bit more than. Um, I eventually realized I should. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> to be put on the spot like that. I don't feel you're going to do it again. Me? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but the next one will be, I'll throw you an easy one. I figured I would ask if you could explain uh, for people who might not know what the difference is between a special trials prosecutor and your more run-of-the-mill prosecutor, and also how that you know sort of helps you distinguish yourself in the genre. Oh, and I can tie this into a really funny remark on um, Amazon. It, 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 on the competition, it was a great review, but they said, and there's no way that any deputy DA goes out in the field with the detectives and goes out to interview witnesses and goes to crime scenes. I know better than that. I thought, really? Do you? <laughs> That's fun. You can tell me how the LA DA's office works. That's fun. Anyway, the, in Los Angeles, the DA's office has special units, and they are specialized, and so they have like narcotics, hardcore gangs, family violence, sex crimes, you get the picture. Special Trials was a very, when I joined, a very tiny unit, four older men, um, that handled all the high profile complex cases in the county. In the county, we, it's a, the office has like a thousand prosecutors, so there were only four that handled that, and they drove all over the county doing it. And what made Special Trials unique was that they pick up the case from the day the body is found. So we would go out with the detectives, talk to the witnesses, go to the crime scenes, and work hand in glove with them on everything, every aspect of it. So we'd work the investigation as well as we'd work, you know, for the trial. And that make that is different because most prosecutors, the rest of the office in fact, the the case gets filed, it, it lands on their desk a week before trial and then they, they take it to court. They don't go in the field and they don't talk to people outside and go to see witnesses or crime scenes like that. They don't have time. They have a stack of cases like this. 
special trials, we had a smaller caseload because each case was huge. Like one of my cases took two years in trial. That's a long time to be in trial. When you have that kind of case, you have to have the time to go out in the field and talk to everybody and do every step of the investigation, prepare the case, make it really tight because these are big cases and the lawyers up against you are big lawyers and they're gonna, it's always a big battle. So um, that's the difference between special trials. Contrary to what that person wrote, <laughs> special trials prosecutors do do that. I did that in every single one of my cases. And that's pretty rare because you, know, you don't find that often in these genre books. And something that you might find interesting, this isn't really a question, just me editorializing, but actually um, three out of the four Rachel Knight books predominantly take place outside of the courtroom which isn't probably something you would expect from martial law. You know what, courtroom, it's really interesting. When people say that a, a drama, a novel, is a courtroom or a legal drama, a legal book, it, look at it carefully. Very, very little time is actually spent in the courtroom. Any of the books you want to pick, Presumed Innocent, um, any of Michael Connolly's books that go to court, they're never really in court. It's all what's happening outside. And then for a minute, you go into court, you get a little bit of testimony, and then you jump back out again. Because <laughs> I can write you pages and pages and pages of testimony, and you know the snore will be heard around <laughs> the country. So it, legal dramas really aren't so much, you know, there's just a drip and a drop of courtroom testimony, where, where it counts, where it's fun, so you don't have to go through all the boring stuff that we do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we talked a little bit about Rachel. We mentioned her BFFs before, Detective Bailey Keller and also Tony, who's a fellow prosecutor. And I just thought I would ask, what, what do you hope to convey about female relationship dynamics through their interactions? I really wanted to show the, the, the close kind of supportive girlfriend relationships that I knew and that are part of my life. And all of these desperate housewives, real, real housewives, are not my experience. All that stab you in the back and cut your throat and all that stuff and sleep with your boyfriend. You know, that, that's, not, that's not the women I knew. And these women, Tony, Bailey, and Rachel, are there for each other in the way that women really can be. So they're the ones that'll tell you, he's bad for you, man. He's gonna mess you up, he's gonna mess you up. And then when you go out with him and he breaks your heart, they're there to hold your hand anyway. That's the kind of support and love and appreciation they have for each other. And they're all professionals. Uh, Tony is a prosecutor in special trials, just like Rachel. Bailey is a detective in robbery homicide. Robbery homicide division in LAPD is kind of like their special trials. All the big cases go to them, that and major crimes. And so Bailey is one of the few female detectives in the unit. And of course, all three of them have hot boyfriends. My <laughs> <laughs> <I> blood <laughs> And reading about them will make you want to eat and drink because they do a lot of eating and drinking. <laughs> you have to live. I mean, you people have to live. So I did, I mean, it's, it's more so in the earlier books, but less so like in the competition. But um, I do bring in the landmarks of Los Angeles because I think it's cool to, you know, get a sense of place. And so Rachel lives in the Biltmore Hotel, which is a landmark hotel, 100 years old. One of the few old things that we have managed to not destroy in Los Angeles. And it's really cool. If you have a chance to go there, um, check it out. They have those tours and everything. And they have, um, they used to have the Oscar parties there, Oscar awards there. And they have these great, great big uh, black and white pictures showing Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. And it's so cool. Anyway, uh, so Rachel lives there because it's walking distance from the courthouse. And um, she gets room service because, of course, this is my wish fulfillment. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and so the three of them are like, they're together a lot, and the Billboard Bar is a very logical place to hang out because then they don't have to drive. They can all crash at Rachel's place. <laughs> See, I'm safe. <laughs> and you can get your Calo Martini there. Yeah. <laughs> so I just thought I was asking, because your storylines tend to be you know, pretty intense, and there's a lot of drama, and we'll talk about the competition in a minute, but how do you think that that allows you to achieve some you know, levity to kind of lighten the moment? Yeah, that's a really good point, John. These, all of the cases are grim. I mean, it's homicide. They're tragedies. They're all tragedies. And when, you have, when you're in that kind of world, I think there has to be a little bit of balance. Because the truth of the matter is, for prosecutors, for detectives, we focus so much on all the, the darkness of life. There has to be, you have to play. You have to get out and do something different. You can't, you know, if you don't balance your life, you will go crazy, which is why one of the other things I loved about detectives 
is they are some of the funniest people I've ever known. Homicide detectives are hilarious. Doesn't seem like they would be, right? But they are. Because they do have such a grim job, they have to have a sense of humor. So I, I wanted to show you that part of the world as well. There's a lot of banter, there's a lot of ribbing each other, and, and you know, joshing with each other. And that's how we balance the world. And so um, the, the women and all the, the detectives, they're always, always joking around and you know, in the middle of everything. So there's a mix, so it's not just all grim and darkness. Speaking of grim and darkness, we will uh, talk about the competition. I have a feeling you're going to do that. What a transition, you see. You think we've done this before. Uh, but anyway, the competition, which is out today, for anybody who doesn't know, it actually it deals with very serious subject matter, um, school shooting, a, a column fine like school massacre. Um, and actually, you know, given what's happened in this state, um, to give you a little bit of background on the book, Marshall had actually written an entire draft of the book, and then Sandy Hook happened. Um, so I thought, you know, I would ask you one: what inspired you to, you know, research and write about this particular topic? And then, you know, given Sandy Hook, how did that kind of impact the process? It was a, one of the weirdest confluences ever. Um, I had studied psychopaths for a long time as a DA because I had, from the first time I picked up a serial killer case in 84, and it's like, the motive is so bizarre. He broke in and he, into these women's rooms, um, always the same way, single woman alone, and left money, jewelry, expensive cameras, didn't touch them. You know, he was there for a purpose. And the, back then, there was very little written or discussed about psychopaths. And I started to study it then and talk to the, the shrinkers and talk to you and read a lot of books and got into it. And then when Columbine happened, I, I went back to it. It was kind of, it was a couple of years before Sandy Hook. And I got to thinking about Columbine and started reading about it. Like, who were these kids? They said they were bullied. They said they were trench coat mafia. They said they were all these things. And I thought, it doesn't fit what I know of their actions sounds more like psychopath to me. And found that that was at least for one of them true. And going through the process of investigating and researching, I realized there are so many myths about who they are and why they do what they do. But you know what, I've got to write about this. We have to talk about this. We have to know who these people are because we can't protect ourselves if we can't see them coming. And so it was like, it was just like a driving passion. I have to, it was like, you know, I got to tell you, you know, and, and it seemed like the best way to reach the most people to tell you is to include all of this research, talking to all the doctors I talked to and all the books that I read about. It. So, and, and encapsulate it in this drama, in this novel, because we have to know this stuff. We have to figure it out. So I, I wrote the entire first draft and then Sandy Hook happened. And it was like, I almost, I was this close to pulling the book. There was a lot of talks with my agent. Maybe I shouldn't do this. This is so horrible. I can't, I don't know, you know. And he said, you know, but you have a vision, you have a passion, you have a reason for doing this. It's more, more important than ever now to talk about this. So do it. So I did it. Um, and then, of course, more things happened and culminated with the most recent in Santa Barbara. And I'm going to tell you right now, I will not use their names. Um, in the book, I did use the names of Columbine because, you know, that's already out there. That train left the station a million years ago. But I don't want to use their names anymore because I am fearful that part of the allure for this kind of person is the publicity and the celebrity that they get. And yeah, I know you're thinking, oh, but they're dead. So how can they appreciate it? They don't care. They don't care. It's a whole different mentality. So whatever I can do to prevent anybody from saying their names or giving them more, but we still have to talk about it. We can't just ignore it and sweep it under the rug. We just don't give them any big play for it. So that's that's what went into it. Um, so Rachel and Bailey, in uh, they pick up a school shooting a la Columbine, um, and these are two shooters that imitated Columbine on purpose. And the competition is that they're going to be the worst, the biggest killers of all. And what they believe to be the two shooters that are found dead in the library, just like in Columbine, um, turns out not to be. Nothing that they think is true turns out to be true. And in the course of it, um, very early on, they start to consult with two psychologists in order to profile who the shooters might be. And so all of the research that I had, all the books that I read, 
you know, and all that. I spent a lot of time talking to the doctors, and they got really tired of me, not you. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> but what about, but what about, there's just so much to know about the psyche and why they do what they do. So they repeat, they, they go back and they visit with them, and they talk about what drives them, why do they do this, and what kind of person are we looking for? What are the markers, and what are the signs? The signs can be very subtle. One of the biggest questions I pose in the book is, we, we have a tendency to vilify the parents. You know, why do they know? Why do they see it? But with rare exception, there isn't that much to see, because these kids know that what they're doing is wrong. They hide it. They don't show everything that they're thinking or doing. That's why we find the journals way after the fact, all the plans that they were making after the fact. And yes, you might know something's wrong with Johnny. He's acting very strangely. He doesn't have very many friends. That was the guy in Santa Barbara. He's very antisocial and he doesn't, he's not, you know, he's very unhappy. Okay, but how do you take unhappy and antisocial all the way to mass murderer, right? How does one lead to the other? You know, you need, you need expert advice for that. You need to see, you need to be able to look, and you need to know that you should look deeper to find out. If the police in Santa Barbara, uh, when they were called and told about the YouTube video, if they had simply watched the video before they'd gone to see him, they wouldn't have been persuaded by the sweet voice. They came to the door, and he goes, oh, no, I'm fine, it's all OK. And they believed him and walked away. He knew how to put on a good act. If they knew what they, you know, if they knew if they would read up on his stuff, they would have watched the video, they would have gone to see him, and they wouldn't have bought his act, and they would have searched the house and seized the guns, and no one would have died. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason for the competition. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, I thought that I would ask you, you know, in the creative process, I would think, you know, that dealing with such dark subject matter can weigh on you. And I wanted to ask about that, and also, too, you know, if. If I'm correct in this, you had children who were school age during Columbine, and I wonder, you know, did you draw on that experience and what you were feeling, you know, as a parent in addition to your other roles when you were writing this? 100%. It was really, I have to say, Competition was probably the hardest book to write of all of them because you have the sadness of the parents who've lost their children, and you have the sadness of the parents whose children are the killers. And it's all horrible. It's all, you know, I mean, and I don't want to paint the book like that because it, it's fast and it doesn't, we don't dwell in misery land. So don't think that. But, but in getting into the mind, you know, of, of everybody, you have to kind of be in every position. So what are the kids feeling? The surviving kids, how are they dealing? How do they feel? What's it like for them? We're in there interviewing, Rachel and Bailey are interviewing them and talking to them. Um, how are they feeling about that? And they're nervous and they're scared and they don't want to show they're scared and all the things that kids will feel. And, and including some bravado. Oh, we know. We can handle it. We know what's coming. Now we know. And no, they don't. And, or, or the parents of the kids, the surviving kids, how do they feel, et cetera. So for each person, there was something to experience. And I had to sit there as a parent and think about what is it like, what, what I feel, how, you know, you've got to be there yourself to be able to write about it. I was going to say, actually, Reading the competition, just so you know, I've got a five star review in Harper Books Examiner today. I don't know. <laughs> it's just a lovely coincidence. It is very entertaining. Um, but I will say, you know, having read the book, I think one of the most impactful things is your characterization of, you know, the parents of the shooters. Because in society, I think that we tend to vilify them, and depending on the circumstances, they can very much be a victim of circumstance as well. So I thought that was you know, impactful, and we've already talked a bit about that. Um, but just more generally, you know, in dealing with very serious subject matter, how do you think that working in fiction can sort of help us to better understand reality? Yeah, I think that it was John Cocteau who said, fiction is the lie that tells the truth. We can tell many more truths through fiction than we can through nonfiction. So when you read, and it gives you the remove of, you know, the competition deals with dark matter, but it's not true. It didn't happen. And these kids don't exist, and hopefully will never be allowed. Um, as we get smarter and smarter, something like this will become more and more of a remote thing. But it becomes remote because we learn about it, because we get ready for it, we think about it. And in that respect, I think fiction can, fiction teaches us all the time. Um, and it teaches us in a way that is more palatable. It's more, because it's a remove, because there is that feeling of um, it's not true. You know, we can still learn from it. But I think all books, all fiction actually, 
kind of stems from all fiction. This, this genre, thrill, mystery, thriller, kind of stems from what scares us. We all think about, that's, that's what we write about, what scares us, horror does too. So for me, I'm, <laughs> I'm more afraid of ghosts and, <laughs> and, and, you know, and vampires and stuff than I am with killers, and there is no logic to this. <laughs> I can't read Stephen King. <laughs> I'm so glad now he's writing just murder mysteries. <laughs> I can read him again. But, um, but so we do, we write about what scares us in an effort to understand it. And I think fiction can help us understand that almost better than nonfiction because we, it, there is a safety to it. Um, and on a lighter note, um, you know, the books stand alone in the sense that each book deals with a particular case but they're sort of an overall story arc as well because there are characters who come back in each of these books. They have personal relationships. You know, Rachel has some deep, dark issues that have evolved. And so I'm wondering how you see this book as a progression of that overall story arc. Well, that's tiny. <laughs> okay, so Rachel, Rachel um, has a complicated past. She was born up in Sebastopol, California, which was, which is now kind of a hippie town, but back then was simply a new developed place that was kind of carved out of the woods up north of San Francisco, and young families lived there because they could afford to, and she and her older sister, Romy, um, lived and played there with all the kids. Um, and when she was six years old and Romy was nine, uh, they were playing hide-and-go-seek for Rachel's birthday, and Romy was abducted in front of her and taken away and she never reappeared and Rachel is constantly searching for her. Uh, her dis Romy's disappearance destroyed the family. Um, the father wound up drinking and becoming an alcoholic and then dying and then the mother um, was virtually catatonic. Rachel had a miserable life because she lived in this small town and she was that girl that everybody whispered about whose sister got abducted. And so all she wanted was to get out of there and be anonymous. When she graduated high school, she convinced her mother to move down to Los Angeles, where she wound up becoming a DA, and she and her mom had some very good years together. So that's her past. Rachel has a phobia about privacy. She doesn't want anybody to get in too close. She, um, and she hides the secret of Romy because she has survivor's guilt. Um, and so she keeps it from everybody, including Ray Bailey and uh, Tony and Graydon, her boyfriend, for a very long time. And the discovery of that plays out through guilt by association, guilt by degrees, and then um, killer ambition. By the competition, there, there's um, more of a, well, there, there's an ongoing arc with her trying to find her sister, and there's also an ongoing arc of a, a psychopath who's stalking Rachel, uh, a female. So you have psychopaths galore. <laughs> <laughs> And you should know if you, you know, are friendly with Marsha, you might find yourself in a book. Because, you know, the publicist is a crazy person. And, and then you have, like, the hack doctor named after Miriam, who the, was the marketing director. I'm master. And her name is Miriam Parker. And in the book, she's Miriam Parkovich. It's Parkova. Parkova. Oh, that's the Parkova. It's so hysterical because it's all these people that, you know, the industry, you'll, you'll recognize them. <laughs> And also, I just noticed, look at all these cameras in here. That's not something you're accustomed to, right? No. Oh. cameras. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, anyway, since we talked a little bit about the competition, I thought that I would just ask you a couple of more general questions, and then we will open it up to the audience. Um, but I wanted to ask you, given that you are an expert in the law, um, I'm wondering, you know, how does that knowledge influence the liberties that you will or will not take for the purposes of fiction? Yeah. I, I can't tell the absolute truth because it would be so boring. You know, like, it, we really can't get a jury in panel in half an hour. <laughs> we really can't get a, tri a, a case done through trial, like one of these big cases, in two weeks or even two months. So I collapse time a lot. But that really is one of the very few liberties that I take. When it comes to whether or not there's probable cause to make an arrest, whether or not there's enough evidence to file a case, or take it to trial, what the defendant will do in trial, whether they'll plead guilty, that kind of stuff I tell you the truth about. And I certainly tell you the truth about steps in the investigation. This is how it would go, this is what we would do. And sometimes it is more art than it is science. Um, and there, there's a point in the competition when Bailey, <laughs> they're trying to figure out who they're looking for. And Bailey, and they, they split up 
to um, explore the past lives of some of the kids that they're looking at. And Rachel says, well, so what am I looking for? What am I asking? And Bailey just says, I don't know, fish around. Fish around? That's your plan? <laughs> but sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. You just bump around and you kind of try to figure it out. Because it's not like Sherlock Holmes, you know. I see the eyelash on your left eye. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say she probably spent a lot more time pushing papers around on her desk if it was real life. That's true. And also, I thought I would ask, sort of similarly, how does that knowledge affect your genre of reading? You know, it doesn't. I, I know that there are some um, authors of, in this genre who say they can't read in the genre. I can never read anything else. I mean, I fell in love with Nancy Drew when I was four years old. She did keep alive. She did keep alive, But she's still going so long. She's in trouble. Yeah. And, and I still love mystery thrillers. I mean, I'm just addicted, and, and it's a constant for me, so it, doesn't, it didn't change at all. No, is it difficult to read books written by people who don't know the law, and then you read it and you say, this would never in a million years happen? You throw books across the room when that <laughs> You know, I only throw books across the room when it's an unforced error. In other words, they make a mistake that's easily corrected and wouldn't mess with the plot. Um, sometimes you have to fudge. And those don't bother me, like presumed innocent. Here's a classic example. I love this book, Beyond Speech. But you have to know that if a DA is charged with murder, his office can't prosecute the case. They're going to be recused. They're going to be taken away. So then the, if the attorney general comes in or the feds come in, but somebody else is going to try the case, believe me, the DA's office has got nothing to do with it at all. So that's a big honking uh -uh in the middle of the book. But he had to do it. He had to do it because he the, the the Rusty Savage had to be able to tell you from the defendant's side of the table what he could see going on with the prosecutors because he knew them personally. And it's a great um, aspect of the book that he would have lost if he'd done it legally correctly. So that's okay. That's not an unforced error. That's a forced error. And it works like crazy and it was fine. Others are, are less so. And so when, when somebody deliberately says, um, I swiped his cheek but I didn't get any DNA or, you know, I guess you did. I mean, whatever. You know, it own it. I mean, but then deal with it. It was contaminated. You know, it broke down in, in, in the sun or whatever. There's ways to deal with it. Be smart. Because I think you readers who read in this genre can tell the difference. You know, you can feel it when somebody's cheating, when somebody's taking the easy way out. Conversely, I think you appreciate it. I mean, I think you do. <laughs> You'll tell me if you don't. But I think you appreciate it when we try to accommodate what's real and work around it and say, and in, the, in my books all the time, it's funny because people don't know all the stuff you can do as a DA. For example, there's such a thing as a telephonic search warrant. So if I'm out in the field with Bailey and we need to get into that house right now and I know I have probable cause, we don't want to stop and go find a judge. You know, we don't have time for that. You can do it on the phone and then the judge will swear in Bailey on the phone and it's all kosher, legal. So, so do that. <laughs> You know, so it takes a little more research, but you can accommodate the dramatic needs by, and, and more effectively, I think, by, by doing it realistically. Okay. Writing question for aspiring writers out there. And it's a two-parter because I love those who know I love those. Thank you. So, firstly, are you a plotter or a pantser? <laughs> pantser is, you, you know, you make it up as you go. And the second part of that question would be, um, you know, in dealing with the special trials unit, the very complex cases where you have to kind of put together a story, do you think that that helps you in your fiction story development? So plotter or pantser? Plotter meaning do you outline or, and pantser, do you not outline? Just in, I'm a plotzer. <laughs> I do both. I do, I do an outline, you know, in a very loose sense, but then I don't necessarily follow it. So I'll go through and I'll say, oh, that, okay, okay, mm, that doesn't work, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. So it's kind of an ongoing thing. Um, yeah, I think that doing the big case, you have to be very, you have to organize and you have to think dramatically. And certainly we used to think in terms of the jury's going to go out at 4.30, who's the last witness I want them to be listening to? <laughs> go home and think about. So the same thing happens in, in a book. You know, you want every chapter to end on something intriguing. Um, but you don't want it to be contrived, you want it to be real. So, but, but that kind of organization of the nuances and ins and outs certainly, I think it helped. Yeah. Except that it's better in a book because if I don't have enough evidence, back face, back face, back face. <laughs> Fingerprints were found. <laughs> <laughs> DNA. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Marsha has done some writing for television in addition to the executive producing. Uh, she worked on a drama for Lifetime. Um, and I'm just wondering, one, how did, you know, beginning to write for television sort of rekindle your desire to write fiction and two, another one of those two-parters that we'll forget the first part of. Um, is, does, you know, writing for a different format, does that sometimes change how you approach writing your fiction? Do you have more of a kind of mindset towards making something maybe more visual? Cinema, uh, I think it's what you do. always do this. Um, it's a good question. I'm not sure it changes. I mean, when you write a book, you have to describe everything. You don't have a director. Then you can just say, okay, I need that shot. <laughs> you have to say, I see the trees, blah, 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 swaying in the breeze, blah, 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 better than that. But, you know, um, so you have to, you can't really take one to the other. But I do know that I didn't have the courage to, to try and write novels until I had written for a lifetime on that show called For the People. And writing scripts gave me the courage to say, you know what, now or never, if you want to go for this, go for this. So in that sense, it inspired. But it's a, it, they're very different disciplines. But I do think that the discipline of writing for television helped me as a writer because they require you to write an outline and then do a beat sheet and then you, you, there are certain steps you have to go through that require you to think all the way through the, the hour-long episode. And that kind of rigor really did help to keep me um, on track with the book. Another television-related question. I can turn the cameras off for this. Do you know who A is on Pretty Little Liars? <laughs> I don't. They wouldn't me tell me. I was so, do you know what Pretty Little Liars? It's a, it's a show on ABC Family that has become a phenom for the tween set. <laughs> there aren't any here. Anyway. <laughs> but A is the villain. But we don't know who A is. So everybody should that question. Who's A? I was on the set. I know. Oh, we could have just broken something here. Right. <laughs> All right, two more questions. One, can you take us through a typical day in the life of Marsha Clark, who is writing a book and practicing appellate law and occasionally appearing on TV? How do you balance it? What do you do? This is easy. Marsha's writing. Still writing. <laughs> Still writing. <laughs> I have to go out now. <laughs> that was easy. All right, last question. Since we are in a library, and I'm assuming a lot of readers looking for books this summer, do you have any summer recommendations other than, of course, the competition, which you can buy here tonight and get signed by Marshall Clark? Little plug. Just not that they would have known. That's no. Not cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, who have I read? Who was I just reading? Oh, um, speaking of Stephen King, I just read Mr. Mercedes. It's fantastic. It's really good. And if you've seen Joyland, that came out last year, also by Stephen King. I love Stephen King. Um, you hadn't noticed, I know. <laughs> Who else? Have I haven't had a whole lot of time to read. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, See, we really put her on the screen. when this happens, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry, guys. I'm That's sorry. okay, we can open it up to the audience. And here's what I'm going to do when we take questions for the audience. Because I told you I'm notoriously indecisive, you can all raise your hands and Marsha's going to pick the people oh, here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it's up to, oh, oh, my mother has a question. I'll take her in. <laughs> <laughs> how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Um, I'm, since you know I'm John's mom, I have a two-year-old daughter. Um, I'm really excited about this because I have an aging dog who can't handle it. <laughs> she's a sweetie pie. She's 16 years old, so it, yeah, I can't, I, but I can still hire him. I don't have to move. So right? put that in writing. Right, right, that was everything. It's on tape. You're welcome, Naomi. Faith's a good job. So you start to plant the audience. I mean, this is great. <laughs> um, when your children were young, how did you juggle motherhood and and your work, and also how old are they now? My kids are kids are now. Um, wait, I have to think about this. Twenty-four and a half and twenty-two, <coughs> and they were in diapers <laughs> during the Simpson drop. Um, and it was crazy. It was crazy. You know, juggling. It's, it, you don't juggle. You just kind of go. 
you're, you're going screaming, balls to the wall, 85 miles an hour in every direction. Running to work, and you're running home, and you're running back, and then you know I bring work home so that after I put them in bed, I can work in you know in my room. It's like crazy. It's insane. It was hard. Uh, for Rachel, how many books do you see in your series, and do you already have them plotted out, or is there just um, in the back of your head simmering there? Well, I hope that I get to write Rachel like for uh, like 30 <laughs> books. You know, I love writing about them. Um, not to say that I wouldn't take a step to the side and write standalones too, um, but as long as I can, um, I have ideas always percolating. Always, I have a whole I have whole folder folders of ideas because they happen all the time. You know, wow. He stopped at the stop sign and he looked at her and then he threw something out the window and then he nodded at that guy over there. Oh, that's interesting. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's always happening. I should tell you this lovely lady over here is. Marianne Lewett. Did I say your last name correctly? Lana Wett. Lana Wett. One of my friends, a wonderful writer from Connecticut. Oh, this is Karen Olsen, who's right here in the front. Thank you. I recognize Karen. For Facebook. Oh. <laughs> Other questions? You get the big one. Okay. There's some in the back. I got a question. How do you describe a psychopath? And how do you know? And how do you live your life knowing, like, there's a they walk among us. Yeah. You know, they, and they do walk among us. The thing to know is that not all psychopaths are killers. And um, certainly, and not even not all psychopaths are necessarily criminals, so they tend to be. But they, I, I would hazard to guess that Bernie Madoff probably is a psychopath, or at least a sociopath, right? He's not a killer. Um, there are checklists. There are certain, there are books to read if you want to know. Um, Robert Hare, Dr. Robert Hare has written a couple of really insightful books, one called Without Conscience, the other one called Snakes in Suits. In Snakes in Suits, he's talking about the people you see in the workplace who are very likely um, psychopaths. Um, they're, they're, the hallmark is lack of, lack of conscience. By the time you meet one, they most likely know how to mimic behaviors that look normal. Um, but you can see a callousness, a lack of, um, a lack of empathy, that's kind of the hallmark of it, and it, it, it indicates a great deal more, but what you can see on the surface if you look carefully, um, and you would have to look carefully because they do from a very young age tend to learn how to mimic the appropriate response so that when a friend falls down, they don't laugh. They learn that they are supposed to say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, even if they push them. <laughs> there are a lot of shows on uh, about lawyers, dramas that are there. I wonder if you're interested in those, and I was wondering if you got involved with uh, the Glenn Close one, Damages. Oh, yeah. At that time, I think I was working on another show, um, which was cool. But there are fewer lawyer shows now than there were before. I think that the kind that you saw with Glenn Close is cool. I would like to do the criminal version of that, really dark characters, really dark <coughs> prosecutors who, you know, I <coughs> take justice into their own hands. Mm -hmm. A little wishful so <laughs> First of all, tell me if this is true. This is set up for the question. So it seems to me one of the reasons you succeeded in both professions is that you enjoy and are a terrific creative puzzle solver. A, is that true? I do love puzzles. I love puzzles. I'm addicted to them. <laughs> so. Therefore, could you tell us about, in a puzzle, there can be a eureka moment where things come together. So could you tell us about a eureka moment from A, the real world, and B, the writing world? OK, the real world. Robert Bardo, um, the stalker who killed the actress Rebecca Schaefer. Um, I charged him with. Um, first degree murder by means of lying in wait, which is a special circumstance, which means he gets life without parole. The defense centered on a mental defense. There's no question there was something wrong with this guy. No question. Um, and he had been in and out of institutions a few times. But was he legally insane? He was not legally insane. Um, did he understand right from wrong? He sure did, absolutely. So he was disordered, okay? Oh, many criminals are. Um, so he fought, though, on the basis that he did not premeditate, that the shooting was a spur-of-the-moment thing because he was just overcome in the moment. 
and that would have given, gotten him um, probably a second degree murder conviction, which meant he would be eligible for parole. 15 to life, he means he gets out, or he can get out in about 12 years, um, which was not okay with me. But in the course of preparing his defense, he taped, videotaped an interview with his therapist, the, I mean, the therapist, the psychiatrist who was testifying on behalf of the defense. And in the course of the interview, the, the doctor had him reenact the crime of how he killed her. In California, the, mean, the crime of lying in wait or killing by means of ambush merely means you have to hide your purpose, that the person that you intend to kill can't see what you are intending to do. When he enacted the crime, he went to the door, he had her come down, she came down to the door, he had her actually he went to her door twice. The second time he went back, um, he showed how he stood on the doorstep and that she came, he said she came down, I saw her walking down the hall, and when she opened the door, I said, and so I looked at, I saw, wait, you were holding the gun behind your back. You were concealing your purpose. And that was the moment that, oh, I got you. <laughs> I got you, man. And I, and I did, and the judge said that, that's it. <laughs> that was it right there. So that's the real world. Um, in, in book world, it happens when you're conceiving of the plot, and, it, and you can, you get a, it's that feeling you get when you know the story works, and you get to that point where things just kind of start to snowball. And then, and then, and then, not in a bad way. <laughs> Sometimes when people say that, they go, and then she grew a third arm, and then, <laughs> not like that, but it's kind of like, and then she found out that, um, they weren't the killers, or he wasn't the killer, but it was, but it might have been impersonating somebody who da 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 you know what I mean? It just kind of all starts to fall into place. Thank you. What is your opinion of uh, John Grisham's approach to legal writing? I like John Grisham. I don't know why people bang on him so hard. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I am not a Grisham hater. I, I think that he's a very suspenseful, interesting writer. He's done some great work. Um, I, I, not all of his books are, are, are perfect. No ones are. No ones. Um, but I think he's done some really great stuff. And he has brought some really um, interesting interesting ideas. The firm is a fascinating idea. So I, I, I like him. I'm a fan. I have a question. On, um, you were talking about if we get more knowledgeable about psychopaths or whatever shootings. It feels like open season on children lately. It, it, will this ever, do you think it would ever subside or go away? Or, are, are we learning? That, that's the purpose of the competition. That, that is exactly why I wrote the book. I don't, it won't go away by itself. And the more media we have, I think the worse it gets. I think they aggravate the situation enormously. And I think that in you know, we, we need to figure out who these people are and spot them. We need to get really smart about it. The therapists do, parents do, teachers do. It's all of our business to keep our children safe. And we can't do it by pretending it's not going to happen again, because obviously it is. So we have to learn as much as we can and be proactive. I think for all that parents, in, in the Santa Barbara case, the, those parents were kind of on top of it. They knew something was wrong. They hadn't seen a therapist. You know, they were doing what they thought was right. It just wasn't enough. And people weren't looking deeply enough into it. As a matter of fact, they, and I wrote an article about this that's on um, Forbes.com, that they misdiagnosed him as Asperger's. Asperger's syndrome, no, that is not a violent disorder. It's not associated with violence. But that's and, what they said about um, the Sandy Hook. I know, wow. that's what I wrote about. And, in both cases, I think they were misdiagnosed. Um, I actually talked to a therapist about it, who she, I quoted her in the, in the article. Um, really, the, the defining trait for these two, maybe they also had Asperger's, maybe also. Uh -huh. but, um, but they were both psychopaths, so there's no question. All the same kinds of, of ranting and, and planning and, and in, in the YouTube, you know, he's, he's raging on about all the women who won't sleep with him. She can't imagine why not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, why I want to party with you. <laughs> anyway, um, 
but but you know, it would have been somebody. It, you, so he picked women. So you know, it would have been his roommate. It would have been anybody. It would have been the, the, the mailman. You know, next. I hate all mailmen. They they look at me bad. So we you know, it, it's a matter of looking more deeply. And therapists have to be brave. I, I think therapists are afraid to give that diagnosis of psycho psychopathy because it is very dire, and it's extreme and it's rare. Um, but but you have to do it, or you have to at least look into the possibility of it and not just foist it off with Asperger's when they see. Asperger's syndrome can have some similar traits in that they have flat affect and they can appear to be without conscience. They are not without conscience, but they have that flat affect and, and inappropriate social response that can be mistaken for a psychopathic response. But they're not the same, and I think that everybody's gotta get more honest and more willing to entertain the possibility that, you know, Johnny's trying to kill us. <laughs> Yeah, I, I work with special needs, and I see uh, kids, five and six year old, that enjoy hurting other kids. Yeah. Now, in your research, uh, how are we on these? Where does this start? Uh, from what I've seen, it, they're born. It's born. It's genetic. You know, this is not something that happened, and it's fascinating because people still think that a bad upbringing or a bad home life can turn a, a kid into a psychopath. That's not the case. Uh, upbringing can make a difference in the way that they manifest. They can be more aggravated or less aggravated. But a, a perfect example is the serial killer I was telling you about um, back in the 80s. He had a brother who was a year older than him, a year and a half older than him, raised under the same circumstances. Not good, not good. The brother never did more than shoplift, right? The younger brother was, was a serial killer, right? It, they're, it, they're born that way. And there is, lately, um, Dr. Kent Keel has written um, in the Psychopath Whisperer. Oh, I'm forgetting so cute with these titles. <laughs> anyway, but, um, but it's a good book. Um, and he talks about the fact that there is treatment now uh, for juveniles that they've been trying in a facility, I think, in Arizona that seems to have some success. So, I mean, there, there is a, a positive aspect to this. If we can spot them, they can actually, if we catch them early enough, we can do something about it. Do you have any idea uh, why we're getting so many of these cases in school situations? Uh, I've lived a long time, and I don't remember the past. I know. It see, doesn't it seem like to me too? And, it, and, and yet, in the, world targeting. in the world they're targeting, you know, it feels to me like I, I, I shouldn't bang on the media as much as I do. It's not their fault, you know, but I do think that when you have kids with this kind of bent, and, and let's be honest, clear, it's a tiny percentage of the population, 2% of the population at most, that we're talking about. But that 2%, of course, is responsible for 98% of the violent crime. So, but, but they, I, I do think that they're, they're encouraged more and more to do this kind of thing, to act out, because they, for the glory, for the fame, life means nothing to them. Not their own either. That's why it's all going out the blaze of glory, is, is just talking to them. But they, and they pick a school because it's the place they know. You know, it's what what better environment? It's like fish in a barrel. That's what the the therapists kept telling me when I was getting when I was writing the competition. What they aim for always is to shoot fish in a barrel. These are not brave people. These are cowards. And I even made a point of that at one point in the competition about talking about that. And they're not going to go to Vietnam. Or they're not going to go to Afghanistan. They're not going to do that. And they want to go to a school where there's nobody's armed, and nobody's suspecting them, and they can get the jump on everyone. Um, and I do think that part of the reason we're seeing so much of it is that there is publicity for it. Yeah. It's, it's a way of getting famous. That's, I think that plays a part. Um, the other part is that their um, guns are, are are readily available. You know, and, and it, you know, no matter how you feel about gun control, you got to admit some people are winding up with them who shouldn't have them. Part of it is a rapid fire, multiple multiple firing mm -hmm. firearms. That's true too. That's true too. Yeah. They don't have fully automatic necessarily, but it's fast enough. I mean, we have time for two more questions. Okay. Can you tell us something about your background, your childhood, and what made you become a lawyer? My childhood. I moved all over the country. Like every year, we moved somewhere. My dad worked for the federal government, so we were all over the place. And how that made I didn't need to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't think about that. I was going to work in the State Department. I wanted to work in the Foreign Office. 
But back then, and I understand from somebody who just recently told me, the State Department does not really dig females. Because it's kind of a dangerous job. Yeah, so when I, when I applied back in the Stone Age, when I graduated college, they asked me if I could type. <laughs> <laughs> and so law school happened. <laughs> did you have a question? Yes, I did. Uh, on, the, on the contrary of what you were talking about, I was reading some articles uh, back in the 50s or doing research on something else. And it was funny that a lot, there were a lot of gun clubs in high schools back then and almost no shootings. And I found only one shooting in New York City, too. Yeah. One shooting, and the person didn't go after anybody with the gun. He just wanted to make a point. He shot into his teacher's empty room huh. because he was angry at the grade he got on something. That was mm -hmm. the worst I could find. You sort of, well, what's the difference between now and then? If they had guns in the guns in the what, what happened between then and now? That is an excellent question. You know, I mean, what really, why, why, I wish I could answer that question. I think we're all trying to, right? You know, and what, what, that, that's, that's what made me write the book. That's what made me write the competition, is what the hell is going on? Um, and at that time, of course, Sandy Hook hadn't happened. So, I mean, it, it was to me just, why do these kids exist at all? Because there were others after Columbine. So, you know, what's going on and, and why? And the gun clubs, though, were, were a different story. What did they have? They had them in the schools. Do we even put the guns in the locker? I heard, I, I mm -hmm. even interviewed a couple of people that asked about They even had them in the locker. So kids would pull out the guns, the rifles, right from the, uh, rifles. not handguns, but rifles. Not hand, that's what I mean. Yeah. Rifles, I, yes, and I have heard that. But a rifle is a different story. These kids are picking up handguns, for the most part, or the, you know, the assault weapons, some of them. But so, going, going to what you just said, they wanted to go for a vision of the barrel. Now, if the kids had gun clubs in there, would you want to go into a school where at least 20 or 30 people had rifles in their lockers? And if you did, you would get started. But you know what I'm saying? I know. I know. I know. What's first, right? Including the teacher who teaches the gun club. <laughs> You know, and yet it was okay. It worked out. Nobody did anything. And I, you know, I don't know what to say. Other than the world's gotten bigger. We're less homogeneous. We're more heterogeneous. There's more different, and, and there's probably less supervision in general. You know, there's just less um, attention that gets paid. I think that in schools back then, the, there was the, the per capita to, per teacher, student teacher ratio was smaller. You know, classrooms are bigger now. I think there's just an inability to get their arms around who's, a, who's in class and what are they doing. I don't know that we can even I think they were more tell. mature back then because you, would take, you took on more responsibility at an earlier age. That's lots true. Lots of people were on farms. That's true. Lots of people took uh, part-time jobs. That's so they true. were expected to act more mature. Now, maturity seems to uh, be 35 yeah. rather than 15. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to say that. It seems that way. No, I don't disagree with you. But, but a psychopath wouldn't be deterred. A psychopath couldn't be told to mature. So, and they existed then too. So, still why now? You know? And I, I wish I could answer. Could I ask one question? You could ask. Is it possible that today guns are just more violent than they used to be? Well, they're faster. I mean, you know, when you talk about a rifle, that's a much. That was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> well, then it's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more. Yes, um, psychotherapists, psychiatrists, doctors can identify the psychopaths clearly at a younger age and like early intervention, and they get treatment. But what about the laws? You know, it seems like laws have now gone against committing people who are violent, committing violent acts. I mean, how do you lock someone up when they see you lock up in a mental institution? You know, they we don't have there it's not a, it's not it doesn't have to be that black or white a question when you diagnose a kid at the age of six um as having psychopathic traits that doesn't mean he will eventually act out and become a criminal so you start right there and you start managing them you know you, you give therapy you teach them how to behave right from wrong, that kind of thing and then you don't have to worry about locking them up you know then you don't have to go down that slippery slope of you know yeah. who do we lock up first so do you mind if I ask one more slightly self-indulgent question? <laughs> sure. Okay, I, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Oh, no. So anybody out here who knows me knows that I very much like Gloria Estefan. <laughs> in, in all of my back and forth with Marsha, we have discovered that Marsha, in addition to liking the doors, likes Gloria Estefan, <laughs> which is great. So I want to know what's your favorite song and why. 
I'm so boring. <laughs> and you're all boring. The rhythm is going to get me. <laughs> it didn't got me. <laughs> I got her. All right, so I think we're going to wrap things up. Marsha Clark.